and uh, yeah, welcome to the uh, remote sensing and smart tech uh, uh, session for Marine Litter for the Ocean Decade uh, Laboratory uh, Satellite Activity. I uh, think we're all here. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, and today uh, uh, I, we have already had the, the first session. It was a really, really interesting uh, session. We have a, a very high standard of presentation and, and um, presentations and, uh, and sharing. We're hoping to match that in terms of uh, 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 fluidity of the session and uh, interest of the, of the talks and the, and the questions. Uh, I have a, a couple of uh, small uh, announcements to do about this session. Uh, the event is uh, will be recorded uh, and is now live in YouTube. For those who want, uh, the, uh, the attendees' mic and camera will be off at all the time. And uh, if you have any questions to the speakers and comments uh, for the end of this session, uh, please uh, do so in the uh, in the link uh, uh, below on a Padlet. This uh, will be repeated. Uh, all the links to the YouTube channel and to the uh, Padlet will be uh, uh, repeated in the in the chat. So, just uh, to uh, go back into the what are the objectives of this satellite activity? Well, we wanted to uh, we have. Uh, a very dynamic group of, uh, of people uh, who are uh, in the International Ocean Color Coordinating Group, who are, uh, uh, and there is a task force there. Uh, and we, we, are, um, we are putting together this, uh, this satellite activity to collect uh, the users and stakeholders' expectations to see what uh, users require. And that was discussed in the first session, but uh, also, uh, to uh, give an update on the technologies and and uh, and techniques and uh, and the results and the state of the art uh, of the of the current uh, uh, science on marine litter detection from remote sensing methods and this is this session and tomorrow morning session so uh, please stay tuned if you want to learn more what uh, what you can do with satellites there was a lot of people asking these questions this morning I hope they're here today as well. And finally, uh, we want also to collect uh, or to create a collective vision towards the future on, uh, on, on what is the way forward. What, uh, what are the activities that we have been looking at so far? What is the results that we have at the moment? Uh, what are the needs to, the things that need, need to be done uh, to fulfill the, uh, the, the user's interest and, expe and expectations and, and to match uh, uh, the expectations with what really can be done at the moment. So I hope uh, it will be an informative and really, really exciting uh, uh, session this afternoon. Uh, the speakers indeed, are, I'm sure they're gonna give uh, a very good overview, uh, each one of them. Uh, Manuel Arias from ICM CSIC and uh, Shungu Garaba from uh, the Institute of Chemistry and Biology in Germany, in Oldenburg. Uh, they will speak of the uh, high level uh, and policy uh, things that we'll be uh, uh, trying to articulate in the community. And Professor Shamin, who uh, has a long career in, in, in remote sensing of floating uh, materials from uh, macroalgae into uh, marine litter, and he will also give us a, an excellent uh, review. And then Els, also from uh, Vito uh, in Belgium, who has uh, really exciting uh, uh, results from laboratory and uh, and possibly in situ uh, sampling from uh, different platforms. And uh, so uh, we have uh, 15 minutes per speaker. Uh, we have also an sp a special invited uh, person in the middle to, to break away from all this very serious science. I hope you will enjoy also that. And please uh, conserve your questions uh, for the end of the session. And please, please uh, have a look at the Padlet uh, between sessions or, or between uh, speakers, if you can, and and try to uh, to fill in with your thoughts and comments on the on the sections provided there. And without uh, further ado, uh, please, uh, Manuel. 
Yes, can you hear me and see me properly? I can uh, definitely uh, hear you, uh, hear your, your presentation. Yes. Okay. So if uh, it's just invisible, right? Sorry? Yeah, it's still visible in full mode. Uh, we cannot see your, your uh, presentation at the moment. Okay, that, that's what, what I was asking. Okay, one second. Okay, and now? <clears throat> Now, yes, just need oh, to yes. Okay. Uh, right. Thanks. Thank okay, you. sorry for the glitch. Okay, yeah. so first of all, uh, thank you very much to all of you for uh, attending today and uh, having some minutes to, to listen to our people and uh, all the presentations that we are going to have today. I'm going to start uh, the technical uh, presentations for today uh, with an uh, introductory um, set of slides uh, related to the detecting of marine plastic debris with the satellites. And um, the first thing I wanted to mention today is uh, well, probably something that everybody already knows is what is the marine litter. <clears throat> and the reason why I bring this information is because of uh, marine litter is not a particularly a simple uh, element to, to track with uh, any remote sensing techniques, whereas uh, drones, airplanes, or satellites. Uh, because of the large variety of compounds and elements that it has and the different uh, spatial scales that it takes. So we have litter from uh, pieces of litter from millimeters to, <clears throat> to even uh, centimeters or even meters. And uh, we can find it in the surface of the ocean, on the beaches, and even in the bottom of the seas. Um, in terms of volumes, uh, what we can do currently with remote sensing is just monitoring a part of the total pollution. So it is estimated that around 8 million metric tons per year enter in our oceans. And uh, of those, only just a small fraction really remains in the surface. This is what uh, we are uh, calling right now the detectable uh, compound uh, of the, of the milliliter, uh, which is just the floating element. And, and it is around uh, 6,000 to 245,000 uh, metric tons per year. Uh, which, as you can see, is just a part. The rest of it, uh, uh, it disappears once it enters in the ocean, in the sense that it goes to the water column or sinks directly to the seafloor, and uh, is not observable by aerial remote sensing. There are other techniques for remote sensing that can be called the submarine remote sensing techniques that could have possibilities to, to monitor these elements. But our focus in this presentation is just going to be uh, based in platforms that are aerial platforms or spatial platforms. Uh, said all of this, uh, one of the main questions that we face is why we need remote sensing to monitor marine litter. And this morning, we have seen uh, interesting talks uh, about uh, existing services and uh, stakeholders providing the needs from the community. And uh, one of the key elements that has been seen is that uh, the current uh, in situ observations of marine litter are quite scarce and sparse on time and space. So quite often, it is not easy to gather systematic information from a plastic marine litter that can be then used uh, by models or tools or services to uh, provide the level of information that the decision making organizations need or that entities, industry, companies, or uh, name it, uh, organizations could, could really require. Uh, in the slide, in the left image, uh, this is just an, uh, a well-established uh, publication from Eric Van Seville in 2015, in which he ran a comparison of the results between different uh, numerical models that they were trying to simulate uh, the densities and concentrations of different uh, marine litter uh, compounds uh, throughout the oceans by using uh, a stable Lagrangian uh, transport. The main issue, as you can see in this plot, is that the results between the models can differ between them in a factor of 10 or even 100 times in terms of concentrations, 
some models are not very uh, similar to uh, each other. And large part of the differences between these models happen because of the uh, small quantity of data that they have to, to, to ingest into the models and do a proper simulation. <clears throat> In this sense, uh, what remote sensing can provide to scientists is the concentrations and help to determine the transport dynamics of ocean plastics on the larger scale. And uh, many of the questions actually related to, to, to the spatial distribution and in what domains the marine plastic litter is sending are still open. And uh, remote sensing can inform about uh, data gaps that are existing uh, in respect to the in situ observations that the community is collecting around the world. Uh, this is very relevant for modelers because of modelers, as I said before, they need uh, much more data in order to constrain the results of their models. And at the same time, they also need data to validate and properly uh, determine the accuracy and errors of the of the models. Uh, this is one of the areas where remote sensing can help by providing more systematic routine and uh, global coverage of, of data of uh, marine litter, in particular uh, marine plastic litter. Uh, this is also of use for policymakers uh, because of uh, when we introduce uh, regulations or policies to control or mitigate the problem of plastic pollution at the oceans, there is need to check whether these, uh, these actions are actually having impact in terms of the plastic pollution at the ocean. And to do that, you need routine and again, systematic uh, indicators or uh, parameters that you can observe and you can study to make sure that these uh, measurements are being effective. And finally, uh, what we are calling ocean cleaners or these sets of uh, well-known organizations that are working in, in trying to clean the oceans out of this uh, plastic pollution, they need this type of data to uh, localize or locate the accumulation zones so they can focus or, or make better use of their resources for a more effective cleaning, as well as to assess the effectiveness of such cleaning strategies in order to uh, evaluate uh, whether they need to uh, readapt uh, what they are doing for an optimal uh, output. And uh, the challenge for remote sensing of litter, part of it, I already mentioned it, is related to the large and wide variety of composition as well as uh, sizes that the litter it has, which make it um, quite complex to detect from uh, many uh, different types of uh, remote sensing technologies. And the reason being is because of uh, most of the remote sensing technologies look to a specific uh, particular physical properties of, uh, of the items or, or substances under observation. And when you have a diversity of them, both in the spatial scales and both in composition, it becomes more complex uh, to, to find a single uh, solution able to provide all the information that, that is needed. In this area, we are contemplating that according to the fraction of the mar marine plastic litter that we are considering, we can go from optical uh, spectral techniques like uh, visible infrared, laser-based uh, techniques like LIDAR, it could be an option, to a uh, high spatial resolution imagery. Whenever you need to do identifications of single items, it's almost uh, the, only, the only way to do it. And to microwave-based techniques like radar and passive radiometers, which might have some potential to inform about densities <clears throat> or concentrations of uh, microplastics or smaller fractions around the ocean. In terms of uh, the ongoing uh, research and development activities, uh, the community of remote sensing is making uh, use of a lot of tools to, to improve and develop the, the current techniques. One is to get support from transport models. So even if we feed data to the models, we also use those models to better understand the dynamics of the, of the marine plastic uh, contamination in a way that can help us to understand what are the best targets of opportunity or strategic targets for, for detection with, with, my, with uh, remote sensing techniques. On the other hand, uh, we have also to develop a substantial uh, laboratory measurements for different uh, physical properties of this marine litter in order to uh, understand what are the physical properties that uh, offer the best opportunity to be detected uh, using the current technologies that we have. Um, other aspects that are very important is to better understand how these properties, the, the signal uh, from, from the different uh, compounds of the magliter 
can be seen uh, throughout the different types of platforms. So we have sensors and platforms. Sensors are related to technologies for detection, optical, radar, etc. Whereas platforms are related to the devices that are report, uh, carrying these, these sensors, which uh, namely can be drones, uh, uh, airplanes, or satellites in the case of aerial remote sensing. And these platforms, uh, depending on their altitude, they might need support from physical modeling to uh, better understand the signal that they are observing at the altitudes that they are operating. This is an important aspect to be uh, uh, taking into account in remote sensing. The other important aspect is uh, the deployment of targets and validate, uh, for validation and training of uh, retrieval models, as seen also in, this, in these photographies, where uh, we, the scientists and the community working in remote sensing, we try to understand uh, how the signal operates and also how we can improve our retrieval algorithms to uh, achieve uh, affordable detection uh, uh, of the marine plastic litter in our oceans. In terms of uh, capabilities and efforts, uh, I'm putting now a number of examples of what we are doing currently with uh, remote sensing. Uh, in this case, uh, we are talking about uh, imagery from satellites. This is a spectral data from Sentinel-2. And uh, this is a good example of, uh, of reporting in the literature uh, technique to detect uh, accumulations of floating plastic in the bay uh, and region of Honduras. So in the Caribbean Sea, uh, there are a lot of inputs from of plastics coming from rivers. And uh, this group from Kikaki uh, in, in Greece they have developed a technique that is able to uh, identify these, uh, these filaments of floating plastic material, and that allows for a mapping, geographical mapping of the presence of this, of this litter, and to report of uh, hotspots and events that are producing them. The advantage of uh, Sentinel-2 or Landsat-8 uh, techniques is that the spatial resolution is quite high, between 20 and 10 meters, and this is a very affordable uh, spatial scale for, for many uh, services and, and needs from, from end users. Um, more on this, uh, we can also uh, explore the use of remote sensing to detect proxies of the uh, presence of plastic pollution. So in this case, this is a study from, uh, from areas from myself from, and, and the team that we were working together in advance in which what we tried to aim here was not to detect directly plastic pollution, rather than identify a filaments of floating marine debris with high probability of containing also plastics on it. Uh, this technique was developed using spectral, uh, spectral indexes, so uh, using the information provided by Sentinel-2, in this case, uh, to, 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 to devise or to identify pixels in the image with possibility of having uh, of having the um, floating marine debris, uh, supported with an algorithm of artificial intelligence to produce the classifications of those pixels and enable uh, contextual identifications of those of those filaments. And with all of this, we are generating um, a set of um, of a, a data set of uh, filaments collections. Uh, all of these images are in the Mediterranean Sea. That uh, will be soon available to, to the community for further studies and analysis. And uh, more on this, and this is coming practically hot from the OVN. Uh, this is a very interesting work from uh, the team of Gucci Murphy, in which they have used uh, thermal infrared to uh, identify uh, floating plastic in the surface of the seawater. To do this, uh, what they have done is to uh, deploy uh, initially some set of artificial targets and then produce measurements both in day and night to better understand what it is the impact in terms of the heat transfer between atmosphere and the ocean associated to the presence of plastics. And what they have reported is that uh, these uh, transitions of uh, heat between the ocean and the atmosphere are not behaving the same way when you have just the ocean water and when you have a layer of plastic on top of it. So this differential in the thermal infrared information can be used effectively to detect uh, floating uh, plastic litter. And uh, this is perhaps more known. Uh, there is also the opportunity to use very high resolution satellites. And this type of platforms uh, have a very high 
uh, spatial resolution, we are talking uh, of the scales between uh, 15 or even 30 centimeters, which can be used for uh, actual uh, recognition of uh, uh, floating plastic uh, debris uh, over the ocean, but also in coastal areas of the beaches. In this case, in this study, which was uh, presented by Acuna Roos uh, et al. Uh, in 2018, uh, what they did it was use a constellation of, uh, of, of World View 3 in order to uh, study the accumulations of uh, big chunks of, uh, of plastics uh, present in the beaches of Chile. And uh, similar techniques has been already developed with drones, which are very promising for uh, cataloging and identifying uh, and quantifying a presence of a floating plastic debris that ends up into the beaches of the world. And uh, another uh, recent study, which is uh, preliminary in many ways, is that uh, there is the possibility, even if this, this is still under significant uh, efforts of uh, studying and development of uh, candidate techniques, to use the, the signal reflected from, from the GPS constellation to identify uh, potential accumulations of floating materials in the sea surface. Um, there is a still work to do in terms of identifying uh, or trying to separate the signal from the different potential components. But uh, this is also a promising technique uh, that will have many advantages if successful in terms of uh, providing daily and global coverage for a uh, low resolution accumulations of uh, floating uh, plastic debris. Uh, but as, as I said, uh, this is still an ongoing, ongoing work. So please don't, don't take this uh, yet as a consolidated uh, tool because of it, it is not. Um, uh, in similar way, we can also use synthetic aperture radar, another uh, active technique uh, on board of satellites or airplanes, in which we use the reflected signal of radars over the sea surface to try to find the patterns in the roughness of that surface that can be linked to the presence of floating materials. In this case, uh, it is a very interesting combination of synthetic aperture radar and artificial intelligence where combining uh, information from the SAR and also from a training data set generated from, from optical data sets, one can generate a, a machine learning a tool that it's able to uh, classify within the SAR with a high spatial resolution uh, potential accumulations of floating plastic debris. Um, so going in summary in my presentation, uh, in terms of needs, remote sensing technologies are the solely affordable tools able to provide systematic observations of marine litter, uh, plastic litter at global scale in the able time scales. It complements quite well in situ observations, which are always necessary, uh, both for the development and validation, and bridges the gaps in data supporting the modeling effort. In terms of capability, remote sensing can inform of plastic litter using sensors from kilometric spatial resolutions to centimetric spatial resolutions, for example, satellite to drones. And similarly, remote sensing is probably able to inform in multiple plastic fractions and accumulations, but having in mind that satellite-based solutions are unlikely to report on individual items rather than densities or concentrations for individual item recognitions, other techniques like uh, airplanes or drones are much better suited for this. The limitations is that the no sensor technology is perfect for the purposes of marine plastic litter, with some being particularly challenging or having the specific limitations. For instance, optical remote sensing can only operate during the day and when the clouds are not present, uh, which is, for, for example, a very good limitation of this type of data set. And current results for satellites are still not mature for operational purposes. There is need of significant uh, research and development effort. To conclude, uh, the way forward for, from our side, from our group, uh, in terms of the remote sensing development is that the use of remote sensing for marine plastic litter is an emerging technology and actually requires still significant support from organizations, governments, and institutions to continue developing and reach an operational level. Uh, this is more true for the satellite side of the things. Uh, for drones, uh, the situation is much more mature. 
but uh, still uh, drones that will continue to be limited in terms of the size of the area sometimes that they can operate. So satellites are still on need. The complementarity of the availability of remote sensing technologies calls for encouraging the emerging of various of them as optimal solutions for a global monitoring of the marine plastic litter in all its complex nature and behavior. It is not possible to just use one single technique to get an optimal mapping. Eventually, we'll have to merge different technologies potentially from different platforms in order to improve uh, the coverage uh, both in space and time and the accuracy of the measurements. Moreover, artificial intelligence and machine learning are also areas that we need to, to continue to introduce in this, in this context because they are very well suited to extract useful information from complex data and for fast processing of large volumes of measurements. Future floating plastic detection, classification, and identification will be substantially linked to these other technologies. And as, as I have been saying today in this presentation, there are already many initiatives that they are introducing elements of this uh, of this artificial intelligence in order to uh, afford detection. Continuous exchanges with the stakeholders and societal users of this data and the right services is essential to arrange needs with capabilities and to help shaping the technological roadmap leading to the optimal solution. And who knows, maybe uh, having dedicated satellites in the future for this purpose. Um, and with all this, I think uh, I'm finishing my presentation and I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. You're uh, uh, in relatively good timing. Uh, the questions, please uh, put the questions in the, uh, in the Padlet uh, uh, as well as your comments there. So um, let's hope uh, that, that is all okay for you. Then I'd like to uh, call uh, uh, Shungu um, to take the uh, screen. Okay, are you there ready? Yes, can Go you see my screen? Yes, we can see and we can hear, Go for it. Okay, so thank you, Victor, uh, for the nice introduction. And well, thank you everyone for tuning in. And um, yeah, so my presentation is more of an overview of what we have been doing over the last maybe one or two years in the sense of trying to form a coordinated or like to have a group of experts coming together and having one voice in terms of what we are doing towards remote sensing of marine litter and debris. And um, yeah, so what is the problem? Everyone knows the problem and it is yeah omnipresent in the worst places, the good places, even in Hawaii, the nice holiday place. So this was a beaching event in Kailua in Hawaii recently, like in, I think this was last year. And in another example here, this is Cambodia, you see packaging plastics and just behind here, Let's see if I can also put my pointer. So just behind here, there's a restaurant. So you can imagine all their packaging material is just being thrown here. And then here you have like residential accommodation made weather. And in most cases, this is mismanaged plastic. So um, the motivation like for us to be using remote sensing I think this table nicely summarizes it. And this is like from the IOCCG report 17 or the 2018 report. So it, it, if you really do the math or like the finances, when you are using remote sensing, you have the advantage of special coverage. So you have special coverage, you have low cost per end user, you know, like relative cost per unit area or per end user would be very low. So that's one of the motivation that has brought us, you know, like to come up with or to start working on the topic of remote sensing of marine litter. So of course, here I try to give the same impression we have here. So with the point measurements using net rows over the years, like since the 1970s, when they're like some of the first reports or that are in open access, they have been collecting data in more or less the same approach where you know you have a net row, you collect data, but these are limited to 
in most cases, 30 minutes, you have a, a net row survey of 30 minutes covering, you know, with a net which is opening with 50 centimeters and one meter wide, or in some cases wider. But generally, these are considered more or less like in situ observations. Of course, the value or the amount of information you can gather based on observations, like from uh, net row or like um, point measurements, it is very high. You can do lab analysis, further analysis, but then when you go to remote sensing, like when you start using drones and satellites, then of course you have limited information, but you get to understand the spatial distribution of classes. And in some cases, depending on sensor capability, you can also get some information about patches. So in the next slide, this also summarizes the point I was trying to explain here. So here, I think everyone in, in the audience has an idea of what we talk about when we say microplastics and macroplastics. So here is like a, an example from the um, GESAM report where it tries to just, oh, this is from Ryan et al, but this is also available in the GESAM report. So the megaplastics, anything higher than one meter, but in most cases, the discussion is always about microplastics and macroplastics with the uh, limitation of five millimeter being the diameter um, grade. So the abundance, of course, when you go to the smaller sizes, the abundance is, is growing. And the mass, of course, if you have the bigger plastics, they have more mass compared to the smaller plastics. And the environmental risk, of course, ingestion when you have the smaller size plastics, uh, marine life, fish, or like other microorganisms in the ocean, they might confuse the smaller plastics for, for food. And then with the bigger plastics, you have challenges of entanglement. Same story that is happening with sampling. When you're sampling, of course, sampling right now due to technical limitations, we are uh, up to maybe like the mesh size of naturals. But then of course, the limit is, uh, is is going up towards you know like the bigger pieces you can pick by hand or other devices same as information of origin you can still get more information related to origin of plastic or litter when you have bigger pieces then of course it's easier to also mitigate the bigger pieces so now like to the point of remote sensing we are still trying to understand, you know, like, so this is ongoing research and this is why we have, we want to coordinate things so that if we are talking about an approach or method, it is validated and the, the community from experts to the scientists to um, citizens, they have an understanding of what is going on and we are using the same terminology, the same approaches and we have a universal understanding or close to a universal understanding. And so when, when at the moment, what uh, some of the studies have been showing, you know, like the ease of remote sensing is relatively, um, well, e well ease, is it, <laughs> it's simpler or like, well, we have managed to do proof of concept and we have also come up with different methodologies that have been tested and are, they continue being tested and validated. So at the moment we are still, um, in the field or in the open ocean, we can um, safely say we can um, uh, observe aggregated patches, windrows, and artificial targets. Then, of course, the question: How big are the patches? That's always that's still like a, an ongoing uh, research question. Um, so, like as I was saying, we need a coordinated voice, and just to give you like an an overview or history of where things started, well. As far as I know, of course, I apologize if someone is in the crowd who knows anything beyond 2016, but I should research more on that. But so th since 2016, there has been some work that, you know, like uh, which has brought so many um, experts together. So the, the, this started with a workshop in Hawaii, which was hosted by uh, uh, Nikolai Maximenko. And then from then on, there was like um, another group of scientists in Europe that was hosted by European Space Agency, thanks to Paolo Corradi, uh, who was behind some of the organizing and yeah, motivating the activities. And then in 2018, there was uh, a meeting with the SCORE and Flo uh, Flotsam group, which also brought forward you know, like new ideas and activities. And from these, all these activities in 2019, that's when you know, like the, the community came together to 
come to start writing white papers on how best to proceed and what, where are the scientific gaps, where are the, you know, like the, the law hanging fruits and what else should we go beyond the law hanging fruits. So there was a paper which was led by uh, Victor and this is also in open access. So I have to mention this is on open access and as well, this paper was led by Nikolai Maximenko. It's also in open access. And in 2020, that's when we saw like, uh, I would say large amounts of like funding or resources being mobilized by different agencies. So just to mention a few, the, the Portuguese uh, space agency, they put forward half a million euros uh, towards a study of using artificial intelligence and combining artificial intelligence to understand how best we can also try to reduce marine litter, well, not reduce, but um, detect and or uh, study uh, marine litter using space or uh, remote sensing technologies. Similar uh, in the United States, the NAS NASA also through the ROSES project, they fund, now they have funded three projects which are already started this year. And ESA has also been putting so much effort towards um, different studies that are related to marine litter using resources from space and using technologies like artificial intelligence. And also in 2020, there was a community um, white paper or like community paper, a review, which is also in open access, which was led by Eric Van Sebil. So um, this figure, I like this figure. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm also responsible for the figure, but I like the figure because it, it gives a nice overview of the different technology technologies, platforms and tools that we are using to really try to push the science ahead by understanding how remote sensing can support and maybe also like well, provide information to the community, be it any, uh, well, let's just say stakeholders. So we, we have scientists or like citizens who can also like put uh, cameras on, on, on ships or this could be ships of opportunity or dedicated research vessels. We have people and we have had presentations of people talking about the use of drones. And we have uh, some studies where there's use of aircrafts or, or the or aircrafts of opportunity. And also like the new technology, which is coming up high altitude pseudo satellites. And then of course, the final like platform that is we can launch from, from Earth uh, using satellites or CubeSats. And then of course, there's also fixed observatories that like could be cameras on, 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 on beaches and all these platforms. And in this picture, it also gives you an idea like what the, the, the height at which we are observing things and also like this aerial coverage that you uh, observe. And here we also have to validate what we are observing. So that's where you see the impression of like net trolls behind the ship. Um, so, so far we have, you know, like we have conducted different um, discussions or networking uh, events where we have more or less summarized. So this is a summary, but it's not exhaustive, but the main, uh, goals or what we think the community is asking for. But of course, you're welcome to uh, help us revise this and make this a, a comprehensive um, understanding of what the stakeholders are requiring or expecting from remote sensing. But the main thing is at the moment, what we have, um, what we can say from based on scientific studies and co uh, proof of concept. So there is de detection. So the detection component involves like people might be interested in only the shape, color or size of the objects. So as descriptors, and this can be obtained from any form of RGB cam camera. So be it from a phone, be it from a GoPro. So this is um, easily done using drones or smartphones or other like platforms with RGB information. But then if you want to identify, of course, for some stakeholders, it is very critical to know the, the, the type of polymers. Of course, this could be also influential for policy making and coming up with uh, action plans or rather uh, changing the policies or uh, regulations in different states, member states. So the, the question is identification of the polymers. And then for, for, for this um, identification or distinguishing of polymers, you would require FTIR, which is Fourier Transform Infrared, Raman spectroscopy and shortwave infrared. 
And in some cases, you saw the previous example of thermal infrared uh, technology being used. And then when it comes to the quantification, one thing I have to point out with remote sensing, if you're going to look at um, the ocean surface from above, of course, you would, be have, you would have the limitation of seeing what is at the surface. So the limitation of seeing what is at the surface, you don't know what's below the surface. If you have floating material, you might have some material. So in this picture, if you look closely in this picture, you would likely, well, in this case, I know I am 100% sure, like there were other plastics below. So with remote sensing, you only see what is on the surface, but you don't know what is below. And the, on, the one way you can quantify would be actually, well, you could do actual counts, but from remote sensing, you might be interested in pixel coverage, knowing your pixel is 20 meter by 20 meter, or your pixel is 100 meter by 100 meter. So you either put a percentage to that, or you put a number in terms of like aerial coverage you can calculate from the pixel. And then when you want to study where things are coming from, where they are going, where they are, and you know, like for dedicated cleanup activities, you need to track things. And that's where also like, if you have geostationary satellites that are located, like looking at one location over a time, you can track things. Or if you have, you know, like regular drone service or fixed platforms, that's where they come into, uh, into play. So this will be tracking where things are going, where they are coming from, and also support, you know, like dedicated cleanup activities where you'd easily identify location of um, litter or big patches, and then you can send uh, volunteers or dedicated cleanup uh, teams to um, clean up like uh, litter. Going on, so we have come up with the task force, and you know, like as I was speaking about earlier on, in terms of having a, a, a unified or standardized way of doing things and coordinated by one body of a group of experts. And within the IOCCG, we, we, we managed to come up with a team of experts from agents, space agencies, companies like industry, foundations, research institutes, and universities. So I think here, the, the main message here is we have tried to come up with a, a diverse group of uh, experts who are working towards the topic of remote sensing of marine litter. Um, and just to give you, yeah, to put names to, yeah, to put name, to put names to faces. Here, um, the team is led by, you know, like coordinate or like the, the team at front. We have agency representatives starting with Paolo Corradi from European Space Agency, and we have uh, Laura Lorenzoni from NASA, Debashish Mitra from Israel, and then we have Hiroshi Murakami from. JAXA, and then myself as one of the scientific coordinators or one of the co-chairs. And again, to repeat, the task was the primary goal is to coordinate the advancements of like what is currently available, like what is available at the moment in, in terms of remote sensing technology, be it from drones, be it from space tools. And then we come up with more or less like a roadmap or like ideas or recommendations of what possible like dedicated or rather interdisciplinary tools that might be uh, launched in the future, what they might uh, require or what they should have to support, you know, like remote sensing of marine litter. And of course, like the, the other point is in all aquatic, like our dedication is on all aquatic environments, but this can also be extended to land or in most cases like beach, beach uh, or like coastal areas where you tend to have beaching off washed us or maybe washed ashore plastic litter. And also like we have split the team. So, you know, like to coordinate different activities. I'll explain this later, just to put names again to um, big uh, uh, faces to names. We have Manu Arias, uh, Lauren Bierman, uh, Francois Regis, Martin Luzier is one of the founding members and Victor Martinez Vincent. Um, and just also, well, uh, I'll just give you maybe a second to also write down the link. It would be nice if you can have a look if you're interested. So we have created a one-stop, like I, I would like to call, I think the, the right way we called it is a one-stop shop of, you know, like if anyone is for stakeholders in remote sensing of marine litter and debris. So this is where we hope and believe that, you know, like any information related to remote sensing of marine litter should be found in this uh, on this website. So 
just a brief history of the task force. So this kicked off, like the, the kickoff meeting was in January and we launched the website and, you know, like we introduced the different members. And then in April, things started to move and we had a bi-monthly meeting of the coordinators and the co-chairs. And we had, our, and I'm very proud to say, like we managed to have um, our first workshop and we, we should be having our second workshop very soon and announcements will be coming soon if it's open to everyone. Um, one other thing, like, well, not one other thing, but like the one-stop shop title I've been giving, you know, like, and one thing also to note is the living library bibliography. Why do we call it the living bibliography? We are trying to create a source of information for anyone, you know, like be it citizens, be it scientists, be it stakeholders, where they can find in one place information related to remote sensing of marine litter. So how have we done that? So over since November, 2021, we have about 60 papers, like just references. So here you'd find, you find references related to the topic. Of course, there are other papers out there. We are still looking and we encourage everyone to submit, you know, like if you go on our website, on the, uh, on the task force website, we have uh, a simple like set of rules on how to submit. It's just like the referencing style so that everything is consistent. And also like data sets. If you have data sets you want to share with others, kindly just send us the reference so that anyone who might be interested in your data set that is uh, related to remote sensing of marine litter or debris can always find it here. So again, please kindly share your data and information so that we know you have published something and then others might be interested in that study. So thank you again, if you submit something. Um, again, so the point, again, what I just explained, you know, like our main uh, theme or goal is to promote open access science. And we are also promoting the fair policy. And on our website as well, we do not say like you have to submit your data to this particular um, open rep uh, online repository, but rather we provide you a list of repositories where other scientists have submitted their data. And I think one of the presentation will go into more detail, like OceanScan will talk about like a dedicated um, database where people can uh, submit data related to remote sensing of marine litter. Um, yeah, so one other thing is uh, I was showing you the timeline. Um, I'm also happy to announce that, you know, like the agencies and different stakeholders have been investing so much money into trying to understand, you know, like trying to explore and well, try to advance the science in remote sensing of marine litter. And so the different agencies so far, they have um, uh, funded around over 30 research projects. So in the coming well, year and coming years, we should be getting results. And, you know, like I, I would say, well, watch this space. You should be having wonderful news or, well, updates related to the topic. Um, the previous slide, I was talking about the different coordinators, different groups. So within the task force, we have split, not split, but we work in conjunction with, in parallel. I would say, yeah, okay, we are pillars. The pillars of the task force are, uh, we have the pillars, we have called them core topics. So these core topics work independently, but then we have one way to uh, bring everything together, uh, which is the international experts. But we have uh, Victor, he's leading the technologies. So trying to understand what technologies are available, how can we utilize these technologies, what information they can provide, you know, and then maybe also try to find the gap. Where is the gap in the technologies that are already available? How can we, how can we like recommend the agencies or stakeholders who design instrumentation to provide the tools that we require for our uh, science in terms of like remote sensing of marine litter. So once we get the, 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 the technologies, of course, then we go to data sets. So once you have the data sets, we then go to algorithms and applications. So how do we convert the data we are getting into information that is useful to policymakers, to citizens, to different, like um, one example is how can it be useful to port authorities? There was a presentation on port uh, from a port authority. 
And then also like for fisheries, aquatic, um, for fisheries, how can that information be convert, like useful? How can we present or provide useful information? And how do we connect all this information to interdisciplinary activities? That's where Lauren Beerman is also working on like how to connect the products we are generating from remote sensing, how they can be disseminated to the community. And of course, one thing I just, well, I forgot like, well, um, the teams are either, they, they have regular meetings and then also they are working towards a draft. Again, the term I have to emphasize here, living reports. So these reports would be like similar to Wikipedia type of documents where we try to update them with changes because technology is evolving and things are moving very fast. So unfortunately the evolution of technology and the amount of plastic is just not equal. So that's why, we, 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 we decided to do living reports because all these things as technology is evolving and the amount of plastic is changing and the diversity in plastic is changing. So all these things have to be updated and the timeline is always just, yeah, it's unpredictable. So just to summarize everything, um, well, the, the, the most point is, uh, the, the most important point is space agencies and funding sources, they should fund more advanced add-on works related to remote sensing of marine litter. So that means, you know, like re new research work um, should actually, uh, well, I don't know if it's the right word, you know, like we, are, we should not try to reinvent the wheel, but rather build on what is already out there. So that's why also like we see the task force as one uh, source of such information. So it would be very nice or like it would be, uh, vital, so like for funding agencies and also for scientists outside who are trying to um, study marine remote sensing of marine litter to get an understanding of what the task force uh, or related projects have been working on and obviously some of the results so that we, we try to build off other technology which is already there and then we advance the field instead of doing the same thing over and over again. And then of course, use the knowledge base from the task force to identify, of course, the technology and research gaps, be it also algorithms and how uh, other ways we can uh, utilize uh, the information we are collecting. And right now, like one of the things is pushing and exploring new initiatives. So there's also like the use of airborne monitoring as a synergy with other technologies and promote potential real monitoring applications at regional level. So like different parts of the world uh, conducting regional level uh, observations or be it local level as well. And then one thing, of course, for remote sensing at the end of the day, we need validation. Of course, we can do lab observations, we can do field observations, proof of concept, but at higher altitude remote sensing, we still require well ground truth or sea truth information. And of course, the operative goal from ongoing research would be like how, like, we can realistically detect X or Y if we had a sensor Z. So in order to achieve W, which is needed to effectively support K. So, you know, like the whole idea of doing the task force is try to coordinate such activities whereby we can identify the gaps and also identify the capabilities of the current tools. And with that, I say thank you for your attention. And well, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Shungu. Very, very good presentation. I think the questions will uh, will be happening at the end of uh, all of the presentations. So we're moving very quickly uh, to the next uh, speaker. And this is kind of a, a small break in the, in the different, uh, in terms of, uh, of a uh, topic uh, because we're we're moving away from uh, a little bit of the scientific and um, scientific policy uh, uh, domain into uh, more of a outreach uh, just to give you a break of uh, of these uh, uh, heavy scientific uh, subjects but at the same time it's moving away from the surface of the ocean into the deep so i'm very pleased to introduce uh, Ahmed Garabar from Imagev uh, who's a world record holder for the deepest scuba dive. I cannot dive uh, that, <laughs> not even closer to that. So uh, we'll be talking about the activities that he and his team are doing for plastic pollution uh, in the sea. And uh, there you go. Uh, Ahmed, 
when you are ready the floor is yours so i'm sorry i'm just let me uh, let me just like cancel the camera because i have a little bit like interruption with the internet here in the country so um, i will cancel the camera is that possible yeah cancel or, uh, the camera yeah so i mean like um, if you can just like uh, if you can just like i have the presentation of imagine if first i mean like yes uh, all right. I mean, like, I mean, like, it's it's a little bit. I mean, like, my story is different. Then I can, I cannot actually compete with that with that presentation with a beautiful presentation I just heard right now. But I'm gonna tell you my story about about like uh, sustainability. You know, uh, I did my uh, I did my deep dive record in 2000 uh, in 2014. Uh, it was a six years project for uh, for myself, and then I then I did my dive. I did my deep scuba dive, which is uh, 352.35 meters verified uh, an official still to that day you know by Guinness book of records uh, and then and then I started I mean like and, and during my, my my last part of my deep dive at 27 meters then I had like a shark that was with me for six hours you know and then which is a little bit weird to find a shark in this specific area around so um, as well I mean like during my diving before and after I mean like during my preparation and after my deep scuba dive record I realized the coral reef is not as healthy as before and then so I I, I, start, I kind of like realized and I started I started to see a problem as to see a problem you know like in, in, in the ocean in general you know so I mean like so I teamed up I mean like in, um, in 2015 just one year after I started like I wanted to point this problem out, you know. So uh, I did. Uh, I was able to collect uh, six hundred fourteen divers, and then I did the largest underwater cleanup in a single venue. The most participants in underwater cleanup in a single venue, and that was another Guinness Guinness World Record title as well. Like I gained in two thousand fifteen, like almost one year after my deepest scuba dive record, and then. The whole idea, it wasn't the record itself. The whole idea was actually like to put the attention into the problem. Uh, and then I started like, I mean, like I teamed up with my partner right now, Omar, Omar Samla. He's, uh, he's also like the first Egyptian like to go to Mount Everest. And he climbed the, 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 the highest mountain in each continent because he started also to realize the problem like he has around him as well. Uh, I mean, like after that. I mean, like uh, after that. I mean, like it's uh, we started like to realize like we have like problem with especially with the single single use plastic. So uh, we're in contact. We're me and him. We're in contact in, in, with nature, and we saw like the nature is not the same like before. I mean, like so our motto. I mean, like we had a motto. I mean, like so we need to clean up and we need to solve the problem from the deepest, from the deep, from the bottom of the sea to the to the to the to the mountain, to the mountains, you know, like to the highest mountains. You know, we realize that we have big problem and the problem is mainly as mentioned before from the, from the previous speaker, you know, in the nano, uh, the nano plastic, you know, it's uh, it actually transformed, you know, into more toxic chemicals. Plastic is everywhere on the planet, even in the most remote and protected natural, natural areas, you know, that can be only reached on foot. There is a pieces of plastic as well for every fish in the sea. 700 species are going to ex extinct, you know, 90% of the seabirds have pieces of plastic in their stomach as well. 48% of the sea creatures have plastic in them. At the depth of 2000 meter by 2050, by 2050, there will be like more plastic than fish in the world, the ocean, you know? So we realize the problem is actually with the actual, you know, is with the single, use plastic. The problem is not the plastic, the problem in the, in the, in the, in the single use plastic is unused. And then we need to change and we need to sustain it. Like um, we need to change this single use plastic to be a sustainable, a sustainable use of plastic. I mean, like, like, and there are like a lot of experiences that we like happened around the world. I mean, like it happened as well, like in India and in Nigeria, they made like roads, you know, like, uh, like uh, roads made out of plastic, paving stones as well, like it happens in other, in like uh, some African, some African companies, some African countries, uh, rooftops as well. You know, it happens, uh, it happens now, especially in Europe. And then we started like the name of my company. It's uh, what if, you know, what if 
if we tackle the plastic crisis in the places in the hardest access our protected natural habitats? What if we could solve the problem of the source from the source? What if we could find a genuine solution for plastic waste? What if we could make fashionable again of the sustainable products? This is our thinking here, you know. So uh, our campaign mainly like based on three phases. The first phase is like to increase uh, to increase the awareness, especially with the younger with the younger generation. And this is just by talking, doing workshops in schools, you know, or in the remote areas. Uh, the second thing or the second part is actually is to uh, do the solutions by the actual cleanup, which we already did, like especially in places that doesn't have garbage garbage collecting system. The third thing is uh, finding finding alternatives, you know, like and uh, encourage uh, the local uh, the local uh, uh, industry, you know, like in the Bedouins in remote areas, do workshops for with them, you know, like start uh, start to. Uh, start to give them start to give them like uh, workshops and then and then start to buy their products and then sell it for them sell it for them and then give them profit and then we make profit we make profit as well this is mainly like our our if like and then as well we made uh, i mean like lately we made uh, we made the hackathon a competition we invited artists you know from uh, from around the country here and then uh, like uh, artists, I mean by artists like uh, like uh, like uh, cinema cinematographers, you know, like documentary documentary movie movie uh, uh, pr producers, you know, and uh, painters, uh, photographers, you know, from around the country, like and then to spot to spot the problem, you know, like to spot them, like and then uh, we give him like prizes. You know, like, uh, and then they started. I mean, like, and they were given prize to encourage, to encourage the other, to encourage the other people. They mean, like, to focus on the problem and increase the awareness by doing, by doing all of that. It was kind of successful as well. Like, I'm working on another, I'm working on another, on another project right now. You know, which is uh, a coral, a coral restoration. You know, like, I can see, I can see the problem. I mean, like, it's like as well with the coral, the coral color, color as well. I mean, like, it's not the same like before. You know, so corals and especially in Egypt here, they support human life. Over five hundred million people, you know, worldwide, rely on reefs for jobs, food, and coral coast defense. They are vital for the development, you know, of new uh, therapeutic approach, like the treatment for cancer. And heart disease, which rely on the extract from species living on the reefs, they are vital for supporting the ecosystem. They are also like you know, like to buffer shoreline against ninety-seven percent, ninety-seven percent of the energy from the waves, storms, and floods. You know, helping to prevent loss of life. So, uh, you know, I mean, like it's it's very important. I mean, like especially here in Egypt, you know, of the coast of Egypt, for example, you know, the water of the Red Sea are home to the, some of the most productive and diverse coral reefs in the world. Egypt attracts billions of divers, nuclear, and other coastal visitors from across the globe. This combined with easy access and travel option make of the tourism industry one of the biggest contributors to the Egyptian economy, generating around 300, 389 billion Egyptian pounds in 2018. And provide work opportunities for hundreds and of thousands of Egyptian of Egyptian people. Since we are blessed, we have to have such an uh, an amazing coral reefs providing so much for our economy and people. Where where exactly is there is a problem? So uh, I thought like about like. Uh, like having having like you know like having corals you know like around around the shore the shoreline of Egypt you know like uh, to provide alternative alternative coral reefs for alternative coral reefs you know like uh, because we have like very high traffic in that you know and we have like too many stressors like also affect affect these coral reefs what are these stressors like number one is climate climate change number two is pollution you know so I'm doing a lot of cleanups right now. Uh, 
number number three as well you know like uh, like 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 unaware like people not aware especially who work in the tourism industry you know like the damage coral the they just seek for 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 fast money you know by teaching by teaching like novice divers for example um so i important right now i mean like i have i have like the people who does the know-how i mean like who did that already like in other asian countries i mean like and then right now i'm in contact with the ministry with the ministry of environment you know and then we started this uh this project uh, this project here in uh this is all what i have for now and wait for me soon hopefully i mean like i can have more information to give thank you very much Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, very, uh, very inspirational talk. Uh, I think uh, sometimes when we are thinking about our own science and our own uh, satellite algorithms and these these problems, we uh, sometimes we, we we lose track of where the where the real problem are and uh, and how far uh, uh, something that begins on the surface can reach uh, uh, can reach to the uh, to to the to the deeps and to to to, to coral reefs and an impact on on biodiversity and other and an impact then on uh, on on people's lives uh, and sustains like uh, they cannot uh, earn the money from the tourists the tourists are not getting there so uh, thank you very much for reminding us of from all of all these uh, uh, things with such a such an insight uh, uh, and uh, and beautiful pictures and. Uh, uh, looking forward to to see more of your prowess and uh, and see uh, uh, whether you can do even even greater uh, uh, things like uh, going into uh, into greater uh, either depths or with more uh, people to clean to clean up. So thank you very much, Ahmed. And uh, I think we go uh, to the next speaker, who I think it is uh, uh, Professor Chamin. Thank you, Victor. Can you hear me and see me? Oh, yes. Hello. Good morning right. to you. Yes, I can see you. Thank you. Well. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, let me try to share my screen. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, attending uh, and giving us uh, uh, a presentation today. So we're looking forward. My pleasure. Thank you. Cool. You see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, first, I want to thank the previous speakers. Uh, you guys make my uh, talk much easier for the excellent overview. Uh, there are many types of remote sensing techniques, and uh, my talk is focused on the ocean color remote sensing, basically visible near infrared channels. Um, so I want to convey the message of what is possible, what may be difficult, and what may be even impossible. Okay. So yeah, because of the overview has been covered, so I can go directly to the technical steps. Um, so this is regarding not just marine debris. debris. Um, I use that as a, the same name for marine litter. It applies to all floating metals on the water surface. Um, so the principle apply to everything. Now conceptually, we need three steps to detect and to quantify the floating matter. One is, is there something there? Okay, so that is a purely based on a special anomaly. Once you see, oh, there's something, but the second one would be, what is that? Okay. That will be based on spectral discrimination. Lastly, how much is that? Okay. Neither is easy. And the next, I'm going to show you why. So first step, uh, is there something uh, that is a special anomaly? Um, that really depends on the contrast between your object and the background, right? So if we have a, a pixel of a target pixel, and you have a background model, the special anomaly is defined by the difference, delta r. And that difference mathematically is proportional to the contrast between these two targets, the floating matter and water, and scaled by the subpixel proportion, we call the He factor. 
Okay. Uh, if the he is 0%, then you have no contrast. If he is 100%, the contrast is just the contrast between the floating matter and the water. Okay. So how low can we detect? What is the lower detection limit of floating matter? Uh, that is related to first the contrast and also related to the sensor's sensitivity. Okay, that's a C uh, uh, noise. And the sensitivity is defined by signal to noise. So to make a long story short, if you have a signal to noise of a 200 over one, and if you want to use a single band, the lower detection limit is 0.2%. And for Sentinel-2 MSI, the detection limit is 0.8%. So these numbers should be interpreted as you know, below the subpixel coverage, you have no way to see the anomaly. But above those, you may still have a problem to see the anomaly because you want to use multiple bands, you want to use the index, and that way your noise is higher. But these are the lower detection limit. Now, if we use a single band to achieve, to achieve the best um, you know, detection capacity, the first question is, can we detect microplastics? Is there something there? And uh, I think Manuel showed this image already. And that's based on thousands, tens of thousands of uh, field surveys. So the highest microplastic density is about 10 million pieces per kilometer square or 10 particles per meter square. Can we detect this many particles with an optical sensor? Okay. If we assume the average size of microplastic particle of 2.5 millimeter, and that's in the middle from zero to five, then the subpixel coverage, the he factor is 0.005%. That is 40 times lower than a detection limit from a 200 over one signal to noise rest sensor. So that is very difficult unless you really have a, a huge aggregation of microplastic particles around the front or an AD. And they must sit on the very surface. If they are submerged, we have no way to detect. So that's an extreme difficulty. It's not completely impossible, but very difficult. Uh, what about the other floating matters? Well, as long as they are large enough and the sensor has enough signal to noise, you can detect them. For example, these first two images are from the Caribbean Sea and uh, from this publication. And the bottom two images are from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is, these images show special anomaly. At least you know oh, there's something there. Uh, there are some sleeks. Okay? The same thing occurs to the Mamara Sea near Turkey. And you see this image of slits. Um, this is from Veers. And you also see image of slits of Nova Scotia Shell of Canada. Um, you know, they have a swirl pattern. Uh, you have different image of slits in the Great Salt Lake. Uh, if we expand to the entire globe, uh, this is still incomplete, but even though from all those colored boxes and dots, if you zoom in, you can see a lot of image slits. So these are special anomalies. They tell you, oh, there's some form of floating matter on the water surface. And if this is based on OCHI, the you know, 300 meter resolution, if you zoom in with a Sentinel-2, with a, even commercial sensors, you see more, you see better. Okay. So that is quite straightforward if you have the right sensor, if the floating matter is large enough. The next question is, what is that something, if you see something? Okay. That would depend on the spectral shape of that something. And here's the publication to show the spectral shape okay, of very various uh, polymer plastics. Uh, what you see is, uh, in general, they have a quite a flat spectral shape. Regardless of the magnitude, it's quite flat below 900 nanometer. And there are some features above 900 nanometer, like this one and 1200 and 1600 nanometer. These are caused by the hydrocarbon absorption patterns. Okay. If you can detect this feature, 
then you can say for sure, I have some hydrocarbon compound, compounds on the surface. Uh, but this would be very, very difficult. Most time we don't have this type of capacity. We have only the visible near infrared band. Okay. And likewise, if we look at this type of material, the spectral shape is quite similar. They are all flat. They do not have a narrow band features. Okay. The magnitude changes. And this one, it's a floating, uh, a fishing float, okay, quite the uh, field. Uh, again, you do not have the narrow band feature okay, below 900 nanometer. It's quite flat. And these are not the only materials that are possible on the ocean surface because we have white caps, we have bubbles. The white caps may have some features between 500 and uh, 700 if the bubbles are submerged in water. Okay. If we have very white uh, surface white caps, they also do not have the spectral narrowband features. They're quite flat. And what else do we have? And recently there's a report of a sea snot in Mamara Sea. If you look at the spectral shape of sea snot, it's right here. It's also spectrally flat. They do not have narrow band features. Okay. So on top of this, we have all kinds of floating vegetation and Ava, Sargassum, Chirpidesmium, and the red Nautiluca, green Nautiluca, you name it, and the Pumice Raft. Um, in other words, there are many kinds of floating matters, including marine litter and floating vegetation and other natural and unnatural matters. But so far, you may see, oh, they are spectrally different, even though um, you know, there are two large groups. One is this group. Um, they have a lot of spectral features. The other group, the sea snot, white caps, uh, float uh, uh, marine litter, they do not have narrow band feature, they're flat, but at least we can separate them, separate these two groups. But sometimes even though that's difficult, the reason again is because for most satellite sensors, this type of floating materials are very small compared to a pixel size. Most of the pixels have just a few percent or even less than 1% of floating matter in the pixels. So how do we differentiate when they, are, they have very low uh, pixel coverage? Uh, the trick is to use the difference. So at a low coverage, the contrast between the target pixel and the water pixel, we have seen this in the second slide, is proportional to the full contrast modulated by the heat factor. So take this for example, if we do not use a difference, we just look at a target pixel, okay, the, uh, the black circle, that's a target pixel, and the nearby water pixel, it's almost the same, except the near infrared for the red edge of reflectance. Likewise, for another target, the black circle and the water, okay, they're almost the same. But now if we look at the difference, between these two, the difference is green. The difference between these two is brownish. And the spectral shape between these two, the, the green and the brown, is very different between these two bands, the green band and the orange band. Here is the green ridge. Okay, the 550 has a peak. Over here, the 620 has a peak. So at least you can tell this is some form of a green LG. This is some form of brown energy. And more than that, by looking at the magnitude of this reflectance difference right here, okay, it's 0 0.002. So that is about 1% of subpixel coverage because a full coverage would have about a three, uh, 30%, I'm sorry, uh, 0.3, uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 reflectance. And likewise, li likewise, this is also 1%. Okay. 
So using this technique, we can not only tell the spectral shape difference, but we can also tell the subpixel coverage amount. We can quantify this. Okay. Here is another example to show the previous case. So what are the this slicks? If we look at the spectral shape, okay, this is quite flat. There's no narrow band feature. Okay. In contrast, this slick, you know, the three points, they all have this pigment feature around 670. You know, we know this is chlorophyll A. Okay. Then based on local knowledge, we know when and where this occurred. This is the likely triple decimal. And this, we have no idea what that is. Same thing applies to the Great Salt Lake case. Okay. If you look at the difference spectra of three points from the slicks, they appear like this. Now we compare with a lab measurements of the, the what is it called, brine shrimp X. So these are brine shrimp X in salt water. Okay. The spectral shapes are almost identical. So this way we can not only classify the slicks as brine shrimp X, but we can also quantify the density. But when we apply the same technique to a spectral flat spectrum, we have a difficulty. Okay. So these two are the average macro degree and microplastic spectrum. Again, you see there's no spectral feature. And this is a seasonal, these two are the seasonal features. They are also flat. Okay. So if we just to see a spectral difference, so is that due to micro debris or due to seasonal? Or something like this of Noah Scotia. These are the spectral shape. So what exactly is the feature here? Is the feature here? We have no idea. We can only speculate. And you may say, oh, this looks like a marine debris. Oh, if there's this much marine debris, you will hear from news report almost every day. But white caps can be ruled out because the wind is low and this type of feature lasts for more than a week. But still we cannot tell what they, what they are. That's the difficulty. So that gives, gives us the biggest challenge. Then you may ask the question, well, you are restricted to uh, below 900 nanometer. What if you use a uh, swirl bands, short wave infrared bands? And uh, because this has been shown, you know, if you have swirl band, you can look at those features. That's true. Only when you have many swirl bands to detect this type of feature, you know, to tell the depths. If you have just one or two swirl bands, those would not help. For example, for the spectral uh, feature of C snort, without a swirl band, you see it's quite flat. If you do have a, a swirl band here, what does it tell you? It's low, low reflectance, that's it. You have no additional information. And this is the MSI spectra for triple decimal. And you see the pigment absorption here. If we include both swirl bands here and here, again, other than the low reflectance values, they do not tell you much information. Same thing for the unknown feature here. If you, if we extend to the swirl bands, they don't tell you much. Okay, that's not against the swirl band. If you have three more swirl bands around this two, and you may be able to tell the absorption feature here. Then you can detect, oh, this may be plastics, not something else floating on the surface. So that's the future hope. Um, then you may argue, what about the hyperspectral data? Um, although we do not have operational hyperspectral sensor, but I know several agencies are planning to launch hyperspectral satellites. Well, they're very useful to differentiate between different floating vegetations because they show spectral wiggling here. If you have more bands, you can certainly tell, oh, they're different. This green is different from the brown, is different from the trickle, and is different from the red not to not, not to look at. But when we apply the same thing to detect marine debris or marine litter, 
because they are spectrally flat. Regardless of how many bands you have, let's say I add 10 more bands within this, what extra information do you get? Perhaps very little. So it is useful to differentiate different types of vegetation, but less useful for marine litter with hyperspectral for this range. Next is, what if you have a higher resolution? Because you can use a drone, you can use a low altitude flight. I think the Shangu showed this. Um, that depends on how close you want to go or what is your resolution. Uh, in this particular example, we detect we detected all those uh, slick features of Nova Scotia. If we zoom in with the dove, three meter resolution, we have this slick. And further go to half meter resolution work view, we have the slick. And the spectral shape is always flat. So even with a half meter resolution, we can't tell what that is. It's some form of non-vegetation feature. So we can make a speculation, of course. You may say, oh, what if you have this type of resolution? You can see the individual jellyfish on the surface. Well, this would require sub-centimeter resolution okay, or centimeter resolution. Currently, we don't have. Maybe a drone would have okay, something like this. This is a two centimeter resolution. But even though, can anyone tell me if any of this white spots, there's a white caps, you know, small forms, can any of this white spots be due to marine litter or marine debris or marine plastics? That's just a few centimeters. That's still very difficult, unless we have some local knowledge and we have a full spectrum. Um, so with this, I think I can summarize. Um, for our business, size really matters. It's not only critical for the detection limit and for the unmixing, but it's also critical for spectral, um, spectral discrimination. Um, other than the size, most challenging really comes from spectral discrimination uh, because there are many floating matters on the surface. Uh, plastics, other non-plastic uh, non debris, uh, white form, vegetation, um, especially among non-vegetation floating matters. They are all spectrally similar. You know, this is the real diffi difficulty. Um, but even though at least we can tell for now the difference between vegetation and non-vegetation, and the trick is to use spectral difference rather than the pixel spectral itself. And also use a spectral average to minimize the spectral distortion due to band mismatch. This is particularly important for MSR. If you use a single pixel, you may get all kinds of spectral shapes because some bands have 20 meter, others have 10 meter resolution. They have different portions of the floating matter. Okay? Now, talking about the sore bands, uh, hyperspectral or higher resolution, yes, they are useful, uh, but they also have limitations, uh, depending on how many bands, where the bands are, and uh, what is the resolution. If you can't go into, say, centimeter, you can't tell the morphology, and you, are sti you still need to uh, differentiate the material based on spectral shape. Um, all of these points are conceptual. I have not even talked about how exactly we implement this concept. I know people have implemented this in one way or the other, um, but from this, I hope I can show, yes, it's possible to detect, uh, to detect a marine leader, uh, but at the same time, we need to be cautious. Um, detecting something is relatively easy, but discriminating that something is much more difficult. Um, so with this, I hope you know, um, I, I showed a very brief message, you know, what is possible and what may be difficult. And that's why we have this large team to work on this difficult uh, problem. And uh, I, welcome, I look for your, uh, forward for your, uh, to your questions later. 
Excellent. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chuamin. Uh, it's a very, very nice uh, presentation, very uh, uh, clear messages uh, around. I think uh, there will be some uh, some questions, I'm, I'm very sure, and, I, and it, it will be very interesting to have uh, some discussion about your, your approach here. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have just the last but not least uh, speaker today. Uh, I, uh, else, are you uh, around and ready to share your screen? Yes, hi, Victor. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. <laughs> okay, well, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for uh, coming in and joining today. I'm looking forward to hear your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Can you see my presentation? Yes, it's there and perfect. Okay, great. So uh, I will be talking about uh, optical characterization of uh, marine plastic litter. Um, so uh, with optical characterization, I mean that we want to understand the spectral reflectance of plastic litter. And Cho Min already introduced this in his previous presentation. And uh, I will be showing you some more spectral reflectances of uh, plastic litter. The spectral reflectance is actually determined by absorption and scattering of light by the plastic litter. And for those who are not so familiar with this, I actually compare it also with the human color vision. So our human eye is actually sensitive to the blue, the green, and the red light. So we can say that the plastic is blue, the plastic is uh, gray, uh, orange, and so on. But with a dedicated sensor, such as the one on Sentinel-2, we can look into these colors in much more detail. And we can not only look into the visible, but also in the near infrared and into the short wave infrared. And this can potentially pro provide much more information about the plastic litter. So this is not really new. Um, actually, um, before we started looking into this from the remote sensing community, um, there was already quite some information available from optical sorting in the industry. And this is from a publication from 2012 or, already from Asumi. And at the left, you see uh, the reflectance, the spectral reflectance in the near infrared, the short wave infrared of different uh, polymer types. And you can see very well the dips. These are the absorption features. Um, and these are very uh, representative for the different polymer types and or can actually be used to discriminate between the different polymer types. There has also been research done on, for instance, the influence of a specific label, for instance, on plastic bottles, also influence of the thickness of um, the plastic and so on. Also in the remote sensing community, we have been analyzing the spectral reflectance of plastic and we are doing this by these kind of spectrometers, as you see here in the, at the right. It's an ASD spectrometer. Uh, you can see also the optical fiber attached to the spectrometer. And these are two examples. At the left, you see uh, from publication from Garaba and Dearson from 2018, where they measured dry virgin pellets. At the right-hand side, you see a recent experiment that we've been doing together with Julia Leone from Vliss and where she was measuring uh, dry carat samples. Uh, you see them in the picture here. And if you look at the spectral reflectances, um, you can see again the same absorption features in the short wave infrared as we have seen from the previous publication. Of course, um, if we go into a real outdoor environment, we don't see these real virgin pellets and plastics as I've shown you earlier. This is what we observe in reality. At uh, the left, you see it's a picture taken in Vietnam. It is in a dead mangrove forest, and you can see that the plastic is really trapped into the mangrove forest. Um, so the plastics are really weathered in reality. They have also accumulations of microorganisms and biofalling on the plastics. They have a different structure. So the, you have uh, bags which are wrinkled. You have uh, plastic uh, bottles which are crushed and so on. So this has to be taken into account if we look at the spectral reflectances. What we have been doing, um, we have been gathering real weather samples, uh, for instance, from the port of Antwerp. And this is an example where we measured uh, with the ASD uh, the spectral reflectance of these weathered samples. So you can see, for instance, um, the reflectance of a waste rope. Uh, there is an orange tube, but also some foil. 
And again, what we observe is in the visible, it's mainly reflecting the apparent color of the plastic, whether it's green, uh, orange, or red. Um, in, this, in the short wave infrared, we again see the specific absorption features of the different type of plastics. Only when we have quite thin plastic, like the isolating foil or the transparent foil, the spectrum in the short wave infrared also gets really flat and you don't see the, the, the absorption features are much um, well pronounced. Um, same has been done by Garaba and Dearson, where they collected plastic from beaches along the west coast of the USA. And also there in these real weather samples, you saw the absorption features uh, quite well in the short wave infrared. Um, together with uh, Giulia Leone and within the Pluxin project, um, we have been doing tests uh, of artificial weathering on plastics, where uh, Julia used the sun test weathering chamber, and she simulated one year of solar radiation in Central Europe. And this, the, ref, uh, the, the graph that you see here is a reflectance of a polyethylene, a virgin sample, um, the original sample in yellow, and then you see um, a reflectance of the weather sample in the, for dry and seawater conditions in green and in blue. And you see in the visible that the reflectance is decreasing a little bit. In the first short wave infrared regions, you see a small um, decrease, uh, increase, I mean, in the second region is more or less stable. Um, also, the absorption features are still well preserved uh, also after the, the weathering. A similar experiment where we uh, simulated the biofalling. So the plastic, uh, they were placed in an aquarium to allow a biofilm to form on the plastic. You can see the, the samples here in the aquarium on the right. And you see um, a biofilm here on the carrot sample in the left. Again, an example for a polyethylene sample here. Um, you see in yellow the original virgin sample, and the other colors show you uh, the reflectance with the biofilm for a pristine surface, uh, for a rough surface, and also for wet and dry conditions. You can see a big difference in the visible. We see an overall decrease in the spectral reflectance. You also see an increase in the green, a decrease in the red uh, wavelengths. And in the short wave infrared, you mainly see a de an overall de decrease, but you see that the, the shape is, is pretty well preserved and we still observe the absorption features. Um, another example where you see also the effect of the structure of the plastic. This is a rope, a blue rope, first rolled uh, in compact conditions, then unrolled and then tied very tight along a frame. Um, and um, you can see that um, where the, the, the rope is unrolled, you can see the, the lowest reflect. So these are the blue um, reflectance. So you can see that they have a much lower reflectance when they are unrolled, uh, uh, whereas the compact, in compact condition, they, are much, they have a much higher reflectance. Of course, in real marine conditions, um, the plastics can also be wet. Uh, they can also be slightly submerged. There is also, like Shuan Min already announced, that there is also organic matter in the water. There are turbidity plumes, there is foam, sun glint, and white caps on the surface. And we should, of course, be able to distinguish the plastic from, from all those. Uh, for this, we've been doing experiments in a water tank where we were able to submerge the plastic in the water but we were also able to add sediments in the water and keep them in suspension. This is a result for a dry uh, plastic orange placemat, where you see the dry uh, reflectance in blue. You can see the reflectance for the wet sample in gray. And then for the placemat submerged at 2.5 centimeters, 5, 9, 12, and so on. I can see very well how the reflectance in the short wave infrared decreases. And oh, when it's submerged about 2.5 centimeters, you almost don't see any reflectance anymore. And this is due to the, um, to the, pure, the high pure water absorption in the short wave infrared. You can see a small increase around 1,150. And that's actually due to a local decrease in the pure water absorption coefficient. You can also see that the shape 
in the near infrared changes also due to the uh, water absorption. Um, also already touched upon by Xuan Min, of course, we have to be able to differentiate the plastic also from the white caps and the foam on the surface. And this is actually a nice example to show you some how similar the reflectance spectra sometimes are. So if you look at um, the black dotted line, this is a simulated white cap spectrum. And then you have the green line, which is a, a red plastic bag. And you can see that the shape is very similar. And the same for the uh, wet orange placement in light uh, orange, and then a sample uh, for, uh, from a turbid water plume. And also there you can see how similar the two spectra are and how complex it sometimes is to differentiate between both. I will now show you two use cases where I've been working on. The first one is, the, is, a, is an artificial accumulation zone that we, that we uh, made in the lake in, uh, in Belgium. And the question was there whether we can detect and also estimate the volume of the accumulation zone. We used a drone uh, for this use case and we used the MikaSense Red Edge camera on the drone, which has five spectral bands between the blue and the near infrared. This is the accumulation zone on the land. So it was a combination of weathered plastics coming from the port of Antwerp also some plastics from the Skelt River and some plastics coming from Vietnam. So you can see as a combination of different types of plastic, but also some wood and some reeds so or some organic matter in between. This is a net that we constructed to also contain the plastics on the water and to make an artificial accumulation zone on the water. At the left here, you see one of the drone images, an RGB image. And you can see at the bottom, uh, at the top left, you can see the accumulation of the plastic. At the right, you see the, the net, which was at that time still on land. And in the middle, you can see some reflectance panel that you use for calibration. So the first thing that we did is we calibrate um, and derive the reflectance values from the drone images. So the idea was to really derive quantitative information from the MikaSense camera. And then we applied the random forest classification with only two classes, so litter and no litter. And this was based on 20 different indices, widely used indices. At the right-hand side, you can see the result. So the white shows you the identified litter and the black is the non-litter class. So these are the very first results, but you can see that the algorithm already identifies the, the litter pretty well. It also identifies the reflectance panels, which were also made of plastic and, um, and the nets. You can see a little bit um, noise at the, at the top right. So this is still something we have to improve, um, either by improving the, the training of the algorithm or in post-processing. A second example is where we want to detect individual pieces of litter. Uh, and potentially also in the next phase, try to identify the litter. In this case, we used a fixed camera setup from a bridge and we used three, three different types of cameras. So we have a high resolution RGB camera. This one you see in the middle of the box there. Uh, we have also a multispectral camera. It, were, it was a combination of two MikaSense cameras where in total we have 10 spectral bands. And we have a very dedicated short-wave infrared camera for plastic detection. They were all mounted to point at the same location and they were also constructed in a way that they um, were able to measure the entire day. So it was really an automated uh, setup. Uh, so more information on the short-wave infrared camera. Um, we have been identifying the wavelengths that are useful for plastic identification. And we went to a camera manufacturer in Belgium, Scenix, and they constructed a short-wave infrared multispectral camera, they used an in-gas pixel array where they put some filters on top. And in total, we have six wavelengths in the short-wave infrared between 1,200 and 1,700 nanometers. Um, this is, these are some more pictures from the experiment. Uh, we used um, a boat on the water and we, we threw some plastic ourselves into the water, um, not only plastic, but also some wood and some reed. And uh, what we did is we, um, um, yeah, we developed an AI model, 
to detect uh, the plastics. Um, the goal was to detect litter. Uh, so we didn't make a distinction up till now, uh, uh, distinction between litter and organic matter. Uh, and these are the results of the AI model. And the boxes which actually show you how uh, the, the accuracy of the detection for this particular type of litter. So at the left, we see a 99% accuracy. The yellow object was identified with a 100% accuracy and the right target with 55. But still, this 55, we were pretty happy because you can see that the plastic was slightly submerged. Some other results also for this one, I was happy to see the results. It's, it's a plastic bag you can see here in the middle, which was also slightly submerged and the algorithm was able to detect it with 100% with accuracy. So more results. Um, so as a take home message, I think I tried to show you that the detection of marine plastic litter is quite complex. So we have different polymers, you have different shapes, but we also have to take into account the weathering, the biofalling, and also the features on the surface, such as glint, um, uh, white caps and so on. So that means it's not like a simple transfer of methodologies that have been developed already from industrial sorting. Um, so this means up till now, we have been approaching it very simple and tried to uh, do a general litter of detection of floating material. Uh, and I, I show you that this has a pretty high potential. In the next phase, we want to also discriminate further between organic matter and plastics, which I believe is, is, is also possible. But it, it gets really complex if we also want to discriminate between polymer types. In the end, I think if you have sufficient spatial resolution, I think it's beneficial to combine uh, AI looking at shape and also spectral approaches. And I believe that um, more spectral bands in the near and also short wave infrared can help. Um, in the end, I think we also have to understand very well the use case and choose the right technology for the use case and, um, that we have. I showed you two types where we want to look at an accumulation zone and also want to detect individual litter and where we have selected a completely different type of setup and also cameras. Um, to end, I would just like to announce that we were also doing a, a feasibility study for a marine litter satellite mission. And we just started with this feasibility study. We will now be doing a large stakeholder and requirement analysis for the mission. So we are contacting a lot of people to get their requirements now. We've been also defining a first mission concept and doing a small mission conceptual design study. So if people are interested to know more about the mission, you can contact me or also um, my colleague, Stefan Lievens. So I want to thank you and also want to thank our funding agency, the Blue Cluster in Belgium, the ATTRACT uh, program and also the European Space Agency. Thank you very much. And I will be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much, Els. Uh, very nice presentation, all of you. Um, <clears throat> well, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, thank uh, all the presenters. Uh, uh, and we still have about uh, 12 minutes to address some of the questions. They were uh, slow to come, but I think uh, some of them have appeared. If you, if the speakers wouldn't mind to uh, switch on their cameras for, for the questions, I'll, be, uh, I'll begin to read uh, some of them as they get them from the uh, Padlet. Uh, for the first one I have selected from my left, it's uh, for Chuan Min. Hi, very interesting presentation. And this, this is a question I also had when I was uh, uh, looking at your presentation. It's a, it's a question about uh, deriving the delta R. Uh, and the, the question is, do you need to find a pixel that you know is only water surface and covered by litter to, to compute this, uh, this difference between uh, something that it's litter and, uh, and just pure water and how, I suppose, how do you find that? Uh, where do you put the limit there? Uh, great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's nothing is easy in a practical world. Um, so, you know, this is about image processing. Okay, it's one step beyond the concept. Uh, so how do you find those pixels? 
you can use uh, some sort of image segment segmentation technique to first to find the features. You know, there's a special anomaly. You can use any technique to find the feature and remove all of those non-wanted features, including clouds, um, stray light. You know, you, you, need, you need to have a way to remove those pictures. Then the difference is water, right? You have the feature you want, and you remove all those artifacts, and then all other pixels of the water. You find the, the, the water pixels are closest to your feature, so then you do a subtraction. So that's, again, conceptual. You know how exactly you do that? You need to write some code or you know, call some uh, existing routines from Python or something. Okay, so essentially uh, image segmentation to, to identify uh, what right. So, right. Okay, right. well, it's uh, otherwise uh, they're all in the papers that you have published. So uh, uh, I think uh, details can be assessed there. Uh, another question for you, and okay. sounds very strange, <laughs> but it's another one I have also uh, in my mind. Uh, if you see it uh, so difficult uh, to detect from uh, from remote sense in the plastic, uh, what about other approaches? And this this question comes along and says. Uh, uh, what about extra pieces of information provided uh, potentially by uh, multi-directional, multi-view, uh, and polarimetric uh, measurements? So uh, this is addressing the, okay, we cannot uh, perhaps uh, exploit uh, the visible as we would like. Uh, is there any way out uh, uh, or, or, or would it be worth uh, going looking into that direction even? Well, both uh, Manu and uh, Shangu have shown <laughs> different remote sensing techniques, including the polarimeter, perhaps they have talked about. Uh, we, well, currently, I, I don't know. I don't know how useful or not useful this additional you know, multi angle polarimetry may help to differentiate plastics from non plastics. Uh, I don't have an answer. But what, what I can say is, you know, all I showed are purely based on spectroscopy, you know, spectral shape, you know, how to different. But in reality, we have way more information than this. You know, we know our working environment and we know wind, we know temperature, we know river flow, and we can get some information from a fisherman, news report. So in other words, we know the oceanography or limnology and those, information will be very helpful on top of this type of spectral analysis to tell what it is. So even if I cannot separate, you know, this is plastic, non-plastic, but there's a news report say, oh, you know, on that particular location or neighborhood, you know, there's a report of a marine litter or something. Well, I can say, oh, what I detected is marine litter and from plastics. But yeah. though, you know, those ancillary information you know, is very useful. Yeah, similar yeah. to that polarimetry or others. Yeah, that is, it's indeed uh, something that we shouldn't be uh, only stuck uh, for this problem into uh, the remote sensing and try to exploit all the wealth of, of data uh, that we have. I mean, not only even remote sensing, on just the one uh, yeah. technique uh, of remote sensing. And yeah, so uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Chomi. I, I really appreciate it. It would signal the way forward. Uh, and uh, we have the session on the Friday afternoon where we can uh, discuss this further and there may be some ideas into uh, uh, making this part of remote sensing as a, uh, uh, a decade action uh, uh, integrated with uh, INDOS, which is the Integrated Marine Debris Observing System. So uh, remote sensing is just a part of that uh, jigsaw. Yes. So, uh, uh, okay, now I have another one for else in this case. And this one is saying that uh, the spectra with uh, uh, dry and wet versus pristine and biofold seem to indicate that uh, water has much larger impact in the spectra than the biofolding. Is this expected or we should expect more effect from biofolding than measured in this case? So uh, this is asking whether they, uh, the water attenuation, I guess, is is uh, has got a higher impact uh, on the spectra than the biofolding. And I know that uh, there is also uh, Shungu who's uh, 
waiting for for uh, speaking. So if uh, else, now that I have read the question, can you answer this or address it somehow, and then uh, leave uh, Shungu to to speak a little bit? Um, yes, Victor, I can answer shortly. Uh, yeah, in the experiments that we've been doing, we've been we've seen that the biofalling mainly affects the visible light, um, whereas the um, the effect of of the wetness, uh, if, if the, um, the plastics are wet, that it's mainly influencing in the short wave infrared, which is logical because the pure water absorption is, is extremely high in the short wave infrared. Of course, if you go and submerge deeper, you will be also influencing, of course, the near infrared, the red, and so on. Um, but if it's only wet, it's mainly the effect is mainly in the short wave infrared and the biofalling mainly in the in the in the visible light. So one would expect that in the visible, uh, you have uh, uh, greater anomalies uh, than being only flat. Flat is probably, if it is uh, uh, equally re reflectance in, in all, it hasn't got any color on top of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Coloration by, say, uh, by a falling of algae or, or, or other. Yeah, yeah right. of course, the experiments that we've been doing, that was actually experiment done by Julia. She used this carat sample, which were, of course, um, white or quite transparent so they didn't have any color uh, attached to it um mm -hmm. so you might also have to repeat or doing similar experiments with colored plastics yeah it indicates that there is a lot of uh, complexity within that uh, yes. that separation again uh, it adds this layer of complexity that showing was was speaking about mm -hmm. i i think uh, shungu wanted to have the word and then we still have time. We're managing. We're dosifying those minutes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Victor. Um, so there was a question that was addressed, um, directed to Shanmin, uh, related to polarimetric measurements and multidirectional view. And just to add on to that, um, well, this is well one of the motivations behind the IOCCG task force is to explore all the different types of technologies, and at the moment we can say, you know, like research is ongoing. So I would say if you're patient enough, next year you should have some findings that would answer that very question in terms of polarimetric observations, if they are useful or like how much information they can add, like add to the uh, like range of data sets we are getting from different tools and different technologies. Um, I think some presentations as well tomorrow will also discuss some of the different technologies that are uh, currently being used. I think today we have covered optical observations and for tomorrow, some of the different technologies will be addressed. And polarimetric, yes, observations like studies are being done in lab measurements and also trying to understand field observation, like field data sets, like satellite observations that have already been conducted. So. I would say again, watch this space and yeah, keep checking on IOCCG on our website on publications or data sets that will be available. We should have some answers related to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Shungu. And indeed, if you have any uh, any uh, suggestions or questions, I'm doing the review at the moment on the IOCCG tax task force on, on, on all these techniques. Uh, if you have any suggestions, uh, uh, about polarimetry, perhaps uh, uh, please contact us. Uh, uh, you know who we are. Uh, there is another uh, question, more technical, but I, I would, if you don't mind, Akile Chapa, I, I would refer you to, to contact directly uh, just to, in the interest of time. I, I would stay here and have a, a more interesting and in depth discussion, but I. I am aware that uh, is uh, is a long uh, day for for the people in the continent of Europe. It's uh, still early for for Americans. Uh, I am aware of uh, time is finished almost. Uh, there is only just one comment uh, which I find critical, and it's more about the programmatic uh, part, and it's. Uh, a question about uh, why the do you think I didn't want to leave this uh, unanswered? Uh, why do you think uh, there is such resistance for investigators to share their data sets? Is this common in other uh, research areas? Does money funding play a significant role on this? Well, I, 
if I don't, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll answer this uh, uh, partly. I think it is because uh, of the difficulty to obtain this data. At the moment, it's all uh, very manual, and it reminds me of uh, initial uh, data from biology or, or or things where it's really really hard to get those data. I agree with the question that the, the data should be easily and openly accessible, and it should be a pillar of uh, any further development. So yes, uh, I totally agree. We should be much more uh, looking for cooperation. And with this, I'd like to finish the session, inviting you, thank you again all for your uh, presentations, uh, for your uh, presence, attendance, and, uh, indeed uh, uh, inviting you to the other two sessions in this uh, uh, in this uh, laboratory or satellite laboratory uh, and i think uh, it would be uh, very nice if you could contribute to this to our activity uh, for remote sensing of marine uh, uh, litter we submitted into the uh, uh, into the united nations decade of actions so as part of indos and with that, uh, thank you very much again. Thank you to the organizers and the Air Center. Uh, and thank you for the United Nations uh, uh, organization for, for setting up this event. Uh, have a very good evening and uh, goodbye to all of you. <laughs>